Good morning. Today's Bible reading will be from Jeremiah 37, so the whole chapter. And thank you, Katie, for that introduction as well. The names here are a little interesting as well. Jeremiah 37. Zedekiah, son of Josiah, was made king of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He reigned in place of Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim. Neither he nor his attendants nor the people of the land paid any attention to the words to the Lord that had spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. King Zedekiah, however, sent Jehuqal, son of Shelemiah, with a priest Zephaniah, son of Messiah, to Jeremiah the prophet with this message. Please pray to the Lord our God for us. Now Jeremiah was free to come and go among the people. For he had not yet been put in prison. Pharaoh's army had marched out of Egypt, and when the Babylonians, who were besieging Jerusalem, heard the report about them, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of me, Pharaoh's army, which has marched out to support you, will go back to its own land, to Egypt. Then the Babylonians will return and attack this city. They will capture it and bring it, burn it down. This is what the Lord says. Do not deceive yourselves, thinking, the Babylonians will surely leave us. They will not. Even if you would defeat the entire Babylonian army that is attacking you and only wounded men were left in the tents, they would come out and burn the city down. After the Babylonian army had withdrawn from Jerusalem because of Pharaoh's army, Jeremiah started to leave the city to go to the territory of Benjamin to get his share of the property among the people there. But when he, when he reached the Benjamin gate, the captain of the guard, whose name was Irijah, son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah, arrested him and said, You are deserting to the Babylonians. That's not true, Jeremiah said. I am not deserting to the Babylonians, but Irijah would not listen to him. Instead, he arrested Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. They were angry with Jeremiah and had him beaten and imprisoned in the house of Jonathan the secretary, which they had made into a prison. Jeremiah was put into a vaulted cell in the dungeon where he remained a long time. Then King Zedekiah sent for him and had him brought to the palace, where he asked him privately, Is there any word from the Lord? Yes, Jeremiah replied, You will be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon. Then Jeremiah said to King Zedekiah, What crime have I committed against you or your attendants or these people, that you have put me in prison? Where are your prophets who prophesied to you? The king of Babylon will not attack you or this land. But now, my lord, the king, please listen. Let me bring my petition before you. Do not send me back to the house of Jonathan, Jonathan the secretary, or I will die there. King Zedekiah then gave orders for Jeremiah to be placed in the courtyard of the guard and given a loaf of bread from the street of the bakers, each day until all the bread in the city was gone. So Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. Well, good morning again. Um, some of you might be aware that I was away the last two weeks and we actually took a long drive up to Queensland, a um, long drive with a one-year-old, so we got, we got there for a cousin's wedding in the Gold Coast and it was filled with a lot of um, rain at the start, torrential rain, but as the bride came out, the sunshine gleamed and it was a very beautiful occasion. So we were up the Gold Coast for a wedding, but we thought, well, we're, we're in Queensland, why don't we spend a bit of time elsewhere? So we went up further to Sunshine Coast, and what do you do in the Sunshine Coast when a school is about and you've got a toddler? Well, you go and check out Australia Zoo. So we were off and we explored the home of the late Steve Irwin and his legendary crocodiles. Now... I don't know if you've been to Australia Zoo, I'd never been, and it's all about the croc show. It's a pretty amazing show, you, you've got the croc lurking there in the water, 
And the whole time, the zookeeper, we got to see Robert Irwin himself, demonstrating what not to do when in croc territory. So don't splash about in the surface. Don't lure food in front of him. Make sure you stand metres away because if you encroach on croc territory, he's going to snap. Abby was sitting there quite calm. (laughs) But the show was much about entertaining the crowd with the ferocity of the crocodile as it was about educating the safety and responsibility we humans should have in croc territory. Um, It's all part of Steve's... Well, they talked about how it's Steve's legacy to protect the wildlife and enable crocodiles and humans to live in harmony together. But when it comes to the inescapable reality of God's judgment, what is it that people really need to hear? What is it that we need to keep proclaiming, whatever the cost? So I hope you have your Bibles open to Jeremiah. We're going to be spending our time mostly in chapter 37 and 38. Um, Passages will appear on the screen. Um, But it'd be great to follow along in your Bibles. So we've opened up to the... This is really the final moments of the lines of Judah's kings. And so here's the timeline. We've been going through this term um, with the kings. And right there... At the very end, we're up to Zedekiah. And I've highlighted the three other names before him because Zedekiah, he is the son of, he's one of the sons of Josiah, who we learned about last week, the good king. But he's actually not the heir apparent to the throne. It's actually Josiah's grandson, Jehoiachin. It's very confusing with the name, but Jehoiachin, who's son of Jehoiakim, they're all evil, but he's the one that was ruling, but he got sent into Babylon as part of the, the deportation. He got taken captive to Babylon, where he's, he's living in house arrest. Um, and Zedekiah, he's made king by King Nebuchadnezzar, another big name, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So he's simply a, a puppet king. He's not, real, he's not the real heir of the throne of line of Judah, And as the narrative unfolds, we see that he's a very weak and cowardly man. He's living in denial and fear. He's really controlled by his side officials and by the Babylonians. He's, I just see, you picture a desperate man, clueless and just afraid and I'm not really sure what to do. He has to come to Jeremiah in secret to tell him, ask him about something. Um, He's not a leader, not a true leader. Well, the kingdom is really in the hands of the Babylonians. And so that's where we are in chapter 37 and 38. But there is actually a brief period of respite. The siege has been lifted briefly, very briefly, because the other superpower from the south, the superpower Egypt, well, they've arrived on the scene maybe in support of, just to support Judah a little bit, but they're they're there and Babylon Babylon has decided to withdraw from Jerusalem. But it's very brief. But that very very brief moment, I think Zedekiah thinks, well, this is, I think Egypt is going to be on my side, which was his big downfall. So it's in this context that we hear Jeremiah speaking to the king. He's been speaking to the kings prior, but we're going to, pick it up in these chapters here. And if you like to follow along on, in your notes, I've got three points as we look at Jeremiah's words. So the point one, the undeniable event, judgment has come. Point two, the warning, don't be deceived. And point three, the choice, life or death. So point one, the undeniable event. Let me pick it up from chapter 37, verses 7 to 10. Jeremiah comes to to Zedekiah and he says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah prophet. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of me, Pharaoh's army, which has marched out to support you, will go back to its own land, to Egypt. Then the Babylonians will return and attack this city, 
They will capture it and burn it down. God's word is clear. The Babylonians will come, attack this city, and burn it down. This is the echoing word. Down in verse 17, even after another time, Zedekiah comes to Jeremiah. You will be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon. Babylon is going to take the city. The city will certainly be destroyed. There is no escaping it, and there is no denying it. And it's not just something in the distant future. It's actually happening right, right here and now. There's just a brief period of respite, but it's happening. Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar's come, the army's come. There's already been a few th- thousands. The people have already started being sent or deported to Babylon in exile. Judgment is here. Look around you. They're, they're right outside the gates. You can't, it's not something in the future. It's, it's happening right now. And this... This, this, the Babylonians coming, is not something new. It's not out of the blue. This was God's message to the king that has been spoken through Jeremiah and the prophets before, all throughout. God's judgment upon Judah is here. It had finally come. Judgment for their failure to listen to God's word, to heed his warning to obey him and serve him alone. Judgment because they turn to idols, they worship the other gods, because they they didn't even, they looked at saw Israel, the north, get taken, but they still refused to listen. And this was the this was what was going to happen. Babylon was going to come. And here it was. There is no escaping it. Babylon was God's judgment upon the nation of Judah. This was part of God's plan. It's probably the bleakest and darkest moment in the history of God's people. They might remember some dark history of their time in Egypt, but they'd been rescued from Egypt. They'd been brought into the land through through Joshua, God's power at work there. God had established the mighty kingdom as we learn about in David and Solomon. But now, after generation and generation of kings disobeying, the people disobeying and not having any regard for the Lord, here is the end. Judgment has finally come. And so God's word through Jeremiah, it's repeated. Even when Jeremiah's put in a cistern, Even when he's put in prison, the word is the same. You will be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon. Well, in the midst of this message, God gives Zedekiah a warning. And the warning is, don't be deceived. Now, deceit is one of the most destructive mindsets to have. It's not just the fact that it involves lying, which is bad, but it's about entertaining false hopes. It's about living in denial and saying, well, things are going to be better off and not accepting the truth and usually the hard truth. It's choosing to believe a lie, not the truth. And Zedekiah, he was deceiving himself. Pick it up from verse 9. This is what the Lord says. Do not deceive yourselves thinking the Babylonians will surely leave us. They will not. Even if you were to defeat the entire Babylonian army that is attacking you and only wounded men were left in their tents, they would come out and burn the city down. Now, I mentioned how I saw the croc show and I saw the ferocity of the croc jumping out and snapping at anyone who might dare to approach the surface. Well, imagine we, we said, okay, we had some time at Sunshine Coast. Next holiday, we're going to go up to Darwin and see the northern region. I haven't, even, I haven't been to the northern, northern Territory, but that's a lot of the cro- crocs live up there. And I don't know, maybe I think, oh, it's a late afternoon, why don't I go have a, a nice swim in the shallow waters? 
And I might think to myself, that's okay, the crocs, they'll pass, they're not going to hurt me. Zedekiah and the people were warned, do not deceive yourselves. Despite the clear warnings from Jeremiah, he refuses to listen. Despite the, the, the clear state of Jerusalem, the siege, Babylon is at the doorsteps, deportation has started, there's no hope of rescue, no hope of escape, sorry. He tells himself the lie that the Babylonians will pass. Egypt's on my side. But God says, even if Babylon is weakened, maybe they lose a leg or something, Babylon is still going to defeat you. You have no hope. Zedekiah is like a pawn. Don't deny the reality. The word of the Lord remains the same. The undeniable event, judgment has come. Jerusalem would be destroyed. Now, does Zedekiah listen? Well, God actually gives him, shows him mercy. He actually gives him an offer. He, he, he offers him a choice, a choice to live or die. So point three, the choice, life or death. Now, this choice is actually something that God has been giving his people all throughout history. You can read about it in Deuteronomy as they're entering the land. God gives his people, choose life or death. Listen to me, obey me, and live, or don't listen, and there's going to be curses and death. It's all throughout. And so here again, God offers Zedekiah a choice to live or to die. So pick, me, pick it up in chapter 38, um, verses 2 to 3. This is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine or plague. But whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. They will escape with their lives. They will live. And this is what the Lord says. This city will certainly be given into the hands of the army of the king of Babylon who will capture it. So there again, there's the undeniable event. But he's given a choice. And further down in verse 20 to 23, he keeps saying, Obey the Lord by doing what I tell you. Then it will go well with you, and your life will be spared. But if you refuse to surrender, this is what the Lord has revealed to me. All the women left in the palace of the king of Judah we brought out to the officials of the king of Babylon. Those women will say to you, they misled you and overcame you, those trusted friends of yours. Your feet are sunk in the mud. Your friends have deserted you. All your wives and your children will be brought out to the Babylonians. You yourself will not escape from their hands, but will be captured by the king of Babylon, and this city will be burned down. There again, there's an undeniable event, God Judgment, the, key, the, the, the city will be burnt down, but there's a choice. Now, did you pick up the choice? It's life or death, but what is the choice of life? Well, it's to surrender to the Babylonians. Surrendering to Nebuchadnezzar, that's the way of life. And the other option, the way of death, is to stay in the city and foolishly attempt to withstand the Babylonians and... Yeah, eventually face being captured and tortured and face death. Now, when I first read these verses, I, I, I don't know about you, but I was quite surprised that God's way of life is to surrender to Babylon. Surrendering to Nebuchadnezzar and the superpower of Babylon, is that really the way of life? Maybe you think back to Joshua's day when they're entering the Promised Land. God says to be courageous and fight your enemy and receive life in the land. But this time, the way of life was to surrender to the enemy. Actually, to surrender, not, not just the enemy, but actually surrender to God's act of judgment, which is to live in exile. Surrender to God's act of judgment and live in exile. Now, the extraordinary thing about God's judgment here is it actually is a sign of God's mercy. 
because he promised that he would nevertheless restore his people, but only after exile, only through exile. You see, God's act of judgment is at the same time God's act of mercy. And so listen to what God had told his people just a few chapters earlier in Jeremiah. Jeremiah had spoken and and Zedekiah, he would have been hearing this, but he's not regarding, he's not paying any attention to Jeremiah's word. But this is what Jeremiah had said. In chapter 33, it's on the screen, verses 4. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the houses in the city and the royal palaces of Judah that have been torn down to be used against the siege ramps and the sword in the fight with the Babylonians. They will be filled with the dead bodies of the people I will slay in my anger and wrath. I will hide my face from the city because of all its wickedness. Nevertheless, I will bring health and healing to it. I will heal my people and will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. I will bring Judah and Israel back from captivity and will rebuild them as they were before. I will cleanse them from all their sin they have committed committed against me, and I'll forgive all their sins of rebellion against me. Despite the wickedness of the people and their stubborn disregard of God, God had promised that he would restore the fortunes of his people. He promised to bring Judah and Israel back from captivity, promised to cleanse them and forgive them of their sins and restore them again as his treasured possession. So despite what seemed like the end, exile in a foreign land, what it looked like inescapable ruin, well, this was God's plan to bring life. God's word is good for those who trust him. God's way of life for his people, for people, his people now, or for people, people then, only through his great act of judgment. So only through exile will people now be saved. And actually, if you think about the, king, the line of the kings, and you think, where the prophets, promises of David, the future, where's all that? Well, actually, through the king who was in prison in, in Babylon, Jehoiachin, he's the one that's in the line, the genealogy of Jesus. He's the one that the, the, the line keeps going. Well, Zedekiah, he was offered life and he had God's word of promise, but he did not surrender. He tried to stay in the city and escape the Babylonians. But as the chapter unfolds, the next chapter, and if you read through the two kings, chapter 24... Well, things don't go well for him. His sons are murdered in front of him and he gets his eyes plucked out. It's very gruesome and it's a very gruesome end. God's word is clear. Choose life through trusting his word, trusting his plan, surrendering to his judgment or choose death by rejecting his word, resisting God's plans and trying to escape God's judgment. Well, this choice of choosing life and death, we have this today. Um, We aren't stuck in the middle of a siege um, where the city walls are surrounded. We don't actually have city walls. We have an ocean and we have mountains, but we don't have Babylon on the other side of the Blue Mountains coming in. But God's greatest act of judgment for all mankind, there's a judgment that cannot be denied Well, this actually happened 2,000 years ago, outside the gates of Jerusalem, when darkness filled the land and where one man was handed over, nailed to a cross, and who paid the penalty for sin of all mankind, where he faced the eternal wrath of God. This was the judgment of the world. Jesus says in John chapter 12, so he's with his disciples, He's just had the last supper with them. And he says, 
Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. You see, the cross is God's greatest act of judgment. It is also God's greatest act of mercy. Only, only through the cross, only through Jesus' death and his blood shed for us, and we'll be remembering this as we celebrate the Lord's Supper afterwards, only through the cross can we truly live. Only because of God's greatest act of judgment upon his son, upon Jesus at the cross, we can have life. But as we look around us, well, there's many of us, well, not many of us, but as we look, sorry, but as we look around us, there are many who live as enemies of the cross. Even as we approach the Christmas season with food and festivities, it's family and f- friends, when there are gifts and giggles and getaways and maybe garlands, Many are sadly deceiving themselves and their mind is set on earthly things and not on Jesus. And the scriptures say their end is destruction. It might seem like life to the full or even a brief respite from the challenges and difficulties we face each day, but ultimately the end is destruction. And you might be sitting here today And you haven't yet come to the foot of the cross. Not yet surrendered your life to Jesus. If that's you, surrender to Jesus. Trust in his death on the cross for your place, for our place. And receive life. And not just life now, but life that starts now and lasts into eternity with the God who gives life. And, and there's no sitting on the fence. Don't be like Zedekiah and deceive yourself. And for him, while well, sitting in the city, or swaying between, well, Egypt is my side, or Babylon, back or forth. No, for him, staying in the city meant death. God's act of judgment, seen at the cross, cannot be denied. It's the undeniable event that has changed the course of history. And it's the undeniable event that offers life. So don't resist it. Don't ignore it. Surrender to it. In John's Gospel, these these are words that might summarize the cross. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life for God's wrath remains on them. Surrender to Jesus. Now, when many of us, we have surrendered to Jesus and we, we have come to the foot of the cross to f- receive forgiveness and life. And so just before I finish, I want to encourage you, or urge you really, let us continue to proclaim that message of the cross to ourselves, to our friends, to our family, to our community, As we come to Christmas, let the cross, let Jesus, we might think it's it's an Easter story, but actually Jesus came to save. Jesus came to bring life. He is, let the cross be the center of what we say. And like Jeremiah, who faced terrible conditions for speaking the word of God, the truth, even in the darkest conditions, he was thrown into a mud pit, left to die and rot, Um, He was approached by Zedekiah, probably to hope to have a different and much softer word. But no, he doesn't sway. He says he gives the word the truth that God had spoken. So will you keep proclaiming God's truth? Even if you might be ill-treated. Pray that never nothing like um, Jeremiah. But if you were thrown into a prison or put into a, a, a cistern, or being accused of being a traitor, will we keep declaring the true message of the cross? 
that only through Jesus and the penalty he paid for us will we see life. Well, one thing that stood out for me at the Australia Zoo was, well, the present presenters kept referring to Steve Irwin's legacy and his mission, his mission to protect wildlife and have harmony with crocs and humans and be well-educated for that. Even after his death, Steve's legacy, well, they said, lives on. But we have an even greater message. We have the message of salvation and hope found only through the undeniable event at the cross. So let's keep proclaiming that. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for Jesus and his death for us. Thank you that he paid the penalty for our sin. And only through him, and only because he faced your wrath, we can have life and forgiveness. So help us to keep proclaiming that. And pray that this Christmas we will be, as a church, continuing to um, be proclaimers of Jesus and his saving work done at the cross. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.